Yeah, there we go. Well, hi, folks. Good evening, and welcome to the Map School Little Studies. We appreciate you for being here. We are studying the book First Corinthians. Here's our opening screen, as you can see. And uh, so glad that you are with us uh, this very fine evening. As we uh, have talked about, First Corinthians, uh, author Paul, that's pretty well undisputed, and the date, 55, 56, mid uh, first century, which gives it an interesting kind of a spot in the historical timeline, being kind of midway through. If Jesus died in 33 AD, then you can see that we're like 20 years into it. So, you know, we're not that far, you know, advanced as far as, uh, as uh, uh, the crucifixion and all those kind of things. All right, are we ready to go? I'm ready. Are we? Okay, I'm waiting on everybody to come in. Here we go. Amber's throwing away our trash. Oh, did I miss it? All right, here we go. The uh, book is written from Ephesus to Corinth. Remember the boot, blob, banana, boat? Don't have time to do that, but anyhow, so we're here in the blob. And uh, interesting how... You know, Athens, of course, is the uh, the capital, the, that, the Greek area and all that. But uh, here's where it's not really that far apart by our time frame or our, our travel frame. Is that even a thing, a travel frame? Anyhow, it's not that far apart uh, as far as geographically is concerned. But for them, it would have been, a, you know, a pretty decent uh, journey. It wouldn't have been something you just did overnight, uh, most likely. Okay, here we go. I wanted to review just real quickly. Acts chapter 18, verse 6. When they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own head. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and he went next door to the house of Titius Justus. And the only reason I wanted to bring that up to you is because I want you to recognize that, again, we've got this house church scenario that's happening and it happens largely because of the abuse that Paul was taking with regards to an inconvenient, inconvenient, inconvenient truth that he was speaking. And he was telling the folks about Jesus. He was telling the folks that, you know, they're responsible for the fact that he is the Messiah. We killed him. Well, the synagogue folks didn't like that, so they're pushing him out, and they're resisting him, even to the point that the Holy Spirit would lead Luke to record, where is the word, uh, abusive, that they were actually abusive to him, all right? So that's the history, the background of the beginning of the Church of Corinth. And so the Church of Corinth was one of the first house churches. Oh, I don't know about that. It was a house church in the beginning. I don't know about one of the first ones, because Paul's already been doing a lot of missionary journeys. All right, now, my friends, it is time to step into, how do I get, there we go. It is time to step into the actual text of the book of 1 Corinthians, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. Pretty clear who wrote the book. Start right off, first word in the book is Paul. And so, and that wasn't really in dispute. But we come over here to an apostle of Christ. The word apostle, somebody define for me the difference between an apostle and a disciple. Anyone? Apostle, I say apostle, you just say disciple. Plano, I say apostle. Um, if I'm not mistaken, an apostle is more of a teacher and the disciple is more of a follower. Mm, that's, I hadn't thought of I hadn't really heard it verbalized that way before, but that's definitely true, yes. An apostle, apostolos, <laughs> is somebody who's specifically chosen within the larger team. They would have been the starting five. Although there's 12, <laughs> whatever sport this is that they're playing. And uh, so you got the, you've got them, they're the one, they're the core group, if you will. And then you've got disciples, we're disciples, uh, being that we are students of, okay? But anyhow, Paul is called to be an apostle, but the unique thing about Paul is remember that Paul comes about, he calls himself an apostle born out of due season, and the reason for that is because he is an individual who came to the assignment late in life. Now, I, I probably should have done this. I didn't take the time to do it. But um, you can trace back the story of Paul if you go to uh, uh, Galatians chapter 1. You can find out, which is interesting, that you don't often think of Galatians as being a kind of a historical spot, but it is. Uh, you can trace back the beginnings of Paul by going all the way back to Acts chapter 7. Stoning of Stephen. Acts chapter 9, we've got his baptism. Pedal, and then, of course, from there on, you got a lot about Acts. Acts chapter 22, 16, he's going to talk about his conversion. 
Uh, but in Galatians chapter 1, it talks about how that uh, he spent some time in, uh, in the wilderness, being trained by Jesus himself, etc. So Paul is an apostle. He is specifically chosen by Jesus. We know that from Acts chapter 9, uh, where on the road Jesus himself says to him and also to Ananias, who's going to baptize him, hey, this guy's got special stuff for me. He's going to suffer in ways you don't even know about, but he is a special, so he's uniquely, he's uniquely selected. So he's part of the starting five. He's not just a general student, if you will. So Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. That would have been a mouthful for him to say back in Acts chapter 9 because he was just coming to the realization that he has spent most, much of his early life persecuting, fighting against this Jesus. And now all of a sudden he's going to confess him. Well, not all of a sudden. Now some 20 years later or so, he's going to confess that Jesus is the Christ. Okay? Uh, by the will of God, so God wanted me to be apostle, and our brother Sosthenes is part of this. So Paul and Sosthenes are presenting the book of first. Now, what, why would he mention that? We don't know a lot about Sosthenes. Why mention this guy? Anybody have an idea? Who would Sosthenes be? Any wild guesses? This is Sosthenes, the synagogue leader. Was he the synagogue leader in Acts chapter 18? Okay. <laughs> what else might Sosthenes, why would he might have played a part in this writing of the letter? Uh, Kathy? If he actually wrote it. That's what I was thinking, probably the scribe. Cindy, you, you shook your head at me. Sosthenes was not the synagogue leader, is that correct? I didn't think he was either. Crispus was the synagogue leader. Does Sosthenes come up at all in Acts 18? I don't remember it. Yeah. Does he, what does he do? Verse 17... Then they all turned on Sosthenes, the one who was a synagogue Well, look at you guys. And beat him in front of the court. So he's the guy who got beat up. Yes. Oh, and he was a synagogue leader. But verse 7 was, on the first eight mentions Christmas, the synagogue leader, who was his house, believed. Got it. So we've got the two preacher boys who bumping fists here because they showed me on live. Facebook post. Way to go, guys. All right, so anyhow, so Sosthenes, I agree with Kathy, though, too. I think that it's very possible that Sosthenes could have been the, the, the guy who's writing some of this stuff down. I don't know. Uh, but anyhow, Paul and Sosthenes are the ones who are initiating this letter that they're going to write to the church at Corinth, which is rather interesting because there is no church in all of the New Testament record that has more controversy connected to it, it doesn't seem, than the church at Corinth. I, Maybe I should say that in that there's no more there. We have the greatest record of controversies within the early church, and, that, and that's one of the reasons I chose these two books because I thought it would be really good to study with some folks who really enjoy studying the Bible some of these things out. Kathy, I don't know if this is legit. It's from Wikipedia. Wikipedia, you can always trust Wikipedia. But Wikipedia says it has also been suggested that Sosthenes is a later name of Christmas. It was mentioned in Acts 18.8 and 1 Corinthians 1.14. So it could have been a different name. That's interesting. I had considered that. All right. So notice who we're going to write the book to. This is going to be the Church of God in Corinth. You and I know that. And so that seems to be just a little bit too obvious for us. But remember, he's you know this letter is now going out. And so he's saying to whom he wants it to, uh, who he wants to receive it. But it's also important to recognize that... Uh, these letters, I don't know that Paul knew it at the time, but these letters obviously are going to become part of the collected New Testament. Also, these letters that were sent out by the apostles were often read by not just the church that was specifically addressed, but other churches would get them as well and they would read them, thus fulfilling Acts chapter 2 where it says they continued in the apostles' doctrine. And so that we are, you're reading the actual compilation of the New Testament as it happens when he, when he says so I'm writing this to the church at Corinth the reason that's important about the not just the church at Corinth reading it but other churches is because it puts into motion then the historical which we're studying on Sunday night but the historical uh, precedence of how we got our New Testament so the New Testament when it was presented it wasn't just presented to one group of people it was presented with the whole church in mind you go to the book of Titus, for instance, and Titus is told in his book to actually address all the churches on Crete. 
And so it's, the New Testament was written not just for a specific time frame. It wasn't just a culturally affected moment. This was something that they were writing with the intent that the entire church, or at least many churches in that region, would read it, and they didn't know it perhaps, but we certainly do now, God with the intent that later on, some 2,000 plus years from now, uh, Amber and Blaine and Gabriel and Kathy and Cindy, and etc., we're going to read this. So it's very, I think it's very, very dangerous for us to eliminate certain passages based upon culture when we recognize that what they were doing even at the time was not just for one specific city or one specific culture. They were writing to a particular city or church, but understanding that their message would go out to other places as well. Thus, if they wanted to make sure that this was just culturally specific to Corinth, they would have gone out of their way to make sure that those statements are made just to the church of Corinth. They wouldn't have allowed it to be made in a general fashion so that the entire church would read it. Anyhow, I'm getting off on a tangent that we'll talk about on Sunday with regards to authority, but I'm really fighting this battle with individuals and, and this crazy conclusion that you can just kind of go through the New Testament picking and choosing what, you, what passages you don't like based upon culture. Anyhow, we'll deal with that on Sunday night, so come back and be with me then. All right, so the church of God in Corinth to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. Notice that we've got, we've got Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus, okay? It's, it's not, not Jesus' first and middle name, you know. Uh, th this is a description, Christ, of his name or the person. Jesus means Savior. Christ means Messiah, <coughs> anointed one and called to be the holy people. So he's addressing this to the church, the ecclesia, the called out of God who are in Corinth. So folks who are acting different, folks who are not a part of the world, this little group of individuals, as we saw in Acts 18, meeting in this little home on some back street of Corinth, perhaps, and they are getting together because they are the different, the unique, the called out. That's the church. They're the church of God that meets in Corinth, and then he says, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. What does the word sanctified mean? Sanctified. Set apart. Set apart. Thank you, Mom. So set apart. So those who are set apart in Christ Jesus. This isn't redundant. It's, it's a re-emphasis, but it's important that you see it. The word church and the word sanctified are very, very similar. Because the reason they were the church is because they were set apart. Okay? These are the call, that called out word church. Well, who are you going to call out? Who are you going to set apart? The sanctified. And so it's just kind of two ways of, refer, of referring to the same group of people. In Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. Now again, he's just, he's, this is kind of opening stuff. I realize that to, to some degree it seems like it's just got a lot of niceties, but there's a lot of meaning here. The word holy. If I were to ask you, we will take two or three of you. Give me something that when I say holy comes to mind as an illustration. You would say, if I said holy and you had to associate it with another word, what would that other word be? Holy, you say, anybody? I know, <laughs> Gabriel's thinking cow. No, that's not. I'm actually thinking mackerel. Well, you were thinking mackerel, holy mm -hmm. mackerel. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to cow, though, where did that phrase come from, you think? Holy cow. You think there's any historical background there? Huh? We think Indian. Indian? Could be. I was thinking coming on down even back further, how about Sinai when they come out when Moses was off the mountain and they're down there worshiping a cow? I don't know if that's where it came from, but anyhow, okay, I got holy cow, we got holy mackerel. Now let's deal with something that's actually worth talking about. I say holy, what what do you put in the blank? Cindy, if I said holy, what first comes to your mind? Pure. Pure. Kathy, I say holy, you say, uh, I caught Kathy, she gave me the eyeball. Uh, blameless? Blameless is good. I was thinking more, thank you ladies for, for playing the game, but I was thinking more of, so, give me an illustration, something in your life, something that you do, something that uh, you experience. I say holy, you say Gabriel. You're welcome. It's not like I put you on the spot. I've been running rampantly here with verbiage trying to give you guys time. Oh, you said, I say holy, you say Gabriel. Holy. 
Oh, my bad. Okay. I was going to say the word radiant, but it okay, makes me go. think of like the Ark of the Covenant. Good. How they now we're on to the trail I wanted to be. I know. He kind of made me think of Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones. Anyhow, the Ark of the Covenant. Let's stay with it. What do you got, Blaine? Communion. That's the one I had. I say holy, I think communion. That's the most holy moment that I experience each week. I say holy. Amber says, don't dare you dare call my name publicly because I don't have one. Anything you can think of? I say holy. Anybody, do you guys over here have a holy thought? A holy, a, a, a thought that associates with holy? Well, this is kind of weird, but it's kind of like Gabriel said, radiant. I think of, I wouldn't want to say this. So Kathy's going to give us sound effects. You can't see her, but she's going, <laughs> Okay. Don't touch. Don't, yeah, don't touch, which is, is very close to the sanctified concept. Uh, sunrise, sunset. Uh, I've, I felt very holy sitting at a campfire. Um, you, know, you, get the, you get the idea. Okay, so these are folks who are set apart by Jesus Christ himself. They're called to be holy. Interesting play on words, if you will. Notice that they are called to be holy, just like Paul was called to be an apostle. Okay? So, and Paul is set apart for a specific job. These Christians are as well. All right, so to the church of God, uh, Corinth, sanctified, etc., holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Notice that in this you have the implication, then, that although he is specifically addressing problems in Corinth, it's not limited to Corinth. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ, together with those everywhere who call on the name. So when he's, he's not just trying to deal with a cultural moment in a specific city. He's dealing with that city and using it as an illustration of how you can apply it across the board everywhere. So again, it's very, very dangerous for us to go through the scriptures, picking and choosing according to what we feel like, well, the culture today is not that same culture that they had back then, therefore we don't have to obey that particular verse. When Paul wrote this through the power of God, he wrote it with the intent, by his own words, that everywhere would have an application. But also we know that this, what God did with this, he's going to take it and it's going to be read by other churches at that time, and now, all these years later, you got churches literally around the world who are studying from this book. Okay, uh, Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and, uh, okay, together with everywhere, everywhere, who call on the name of our Lord. Has that phrase come up before? Call on the name of our Lord. Think of anybody who called on the name of the Lord? I'll give you a hint. But I'm asking you when. Acts 22, Paul's telling his conversion story. What does Ananias tell him? Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins. Calling, Calling on the name of the Lord. And so he's saying, these people, where is it? Uh, there, Lord. Where is it? Here it is. Call on the name of our Lord Jesus. So what does it, what does it mean to call on the name of Jesus? Is it like, what's his phone number? You know? No, it's not that. I get his exactly. Attention. Get his attention. That's good. Just to talk to him. Okay. To ask for, I mean, it could be anything. Forgiveness for one thing. Good. If you need help. Just good. Just talk to him. I think ask was the key word you had there because that's the whole idea. You're seeking aid, attention. You're calling on his name. Uh, there are times in your life when uh, go with your, your parent or significant person in your life as far as who's had authority over you in, in, in life, there are times when you don't just refer to them in general. You call them out by name. I, I'm, thinking of, uh, I'm thinking of times when you're a little one like, uh, like Judah and, and Mama in the middle of the night. He is calling her by his name that he has given to her because he needs her attention. Well, that's what happened in Acts chapter 22 with, with Saul. He needed the attention of God. And Ananias is saying, and this is, by the way, part of baptism, rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The calling is part of the baptismal experience. 
That's what you're doing when you call, when, you, when you're baptized, because you're actually adding yourself to the burial scenario, calling on the name of Jesus. Romans 6, 3, 4. Okay, so these are folks, I keep coming up here, that's not it. These are folks who everywhere who are calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you might notice that these are church people. So your calling doesn't stop at baptism, does it? Our calling continues throughout life. We are seeking God in an ongoing fashion. Their Lord and ours, Lord needs master. Grace, probably Paul's favorite word, and peace, he likes that one too. And the thing that's interesting about that is that he came from a background of gracelessness in a sense, if you think about being a Pharisee and the legalism that was, you know, with regards to all of those kinds of things. So he, he likes this grace thing because he knows it's the only way that he could possibly have hope. And peace. The thing that's interesting about, P, about Paul is he spent very little of his ministry, it seems, in a peaceful scenario. Remember how we got the church at Corinth. We got the church at Corinth because they were run out of the synagogue because they were being abusive to Paul. And that's the way the church of Corinth gets set up. And so he, he loves this peace thing when it comes, but it doesn't always come to him. And the reason is because he was a man who was willing to stay with the values of God, shine dark into a, a dark world, and darkness doesn't like it. Kathy? Well, I was going to say the same thing with him appreciating grace. If it was law, 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 and he could never keep it, never keep it, never keep it, he would probably never have peace. And good point. Was, Very good point. He probably, he probably spent a lot of his early life in that conflict of conscience because he never could quite get it where he wanted it to be. Probably is one of the driving factors between, between behind him going to Damascus. If I could just do one more big thing for, for Jehovah God, I could get these renegade Christians and haul them off to prison. You know, and he probably was dry, being driven rather than understanding he can't. It's not up to him. All he can do is depend upon God. That's grace. That, that God, God would work through him. Now, that didn't mean he sat down in his easy chair and just, because we know that. He was more persecuted in the latter part of his life once he became a Christian than he ever was in his entire life. And so he never, it wasn't that he sat down, it was that he recognized that his power was in understanding and appreciating God. So he's going to say grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember back in the day when I was studying in college, they always kind of emphasize that it seems like their letter writing was upside down. That seems to be a line that you would use at the end of a letter, doesn't it? Uh, but he's going to open up with it, and, uh, and, and they, they, they close down sometimes. They close down with some nice things too, but he's going to open up with this saying, my wish for you is that you have grace and that you'll have peace. Now, the reason that's interesting is because he's going to launch immediately into you don't have peace. So I need to address this, okay? Oh, let me go back. Does anybody want to comment on that? Gonna drop the hammer, Kathy says. <laughs> Anybody got a comment on anything here? Because he is, in context, he is gonna drop the hammer here in just a minute. All right, Paul is going to go on to be very nice, very sweet in the opening thing here. I thank, I always thank my God for you because of this grace, another use of it, given you in Christ Jesus, another con, this, I think that's the third time we've had that combination reference to, to Jesus, Christ Jesus, and it's a rather common one in scripture. So I, I'm always thankful for you. And the reason is because of this grace that was given to you in Christ Jesus. Now, let's just pause right here. Knowing what you know about the Corinthian church and all the nuts of stuff that goes on there, you know, I mean, this is a bad, bad scenario. They've got folks, they got one guy who's living with his mother, his stepmom, you know, and in, in, by implication, he's not just living with her. Uh, you know, they, they've got people who are coming into the communion service and treating it like it's some kind of buffet. Uh, it's just a really, really warped congregation. But he's going to say, I'm thankful for you. And you know why I'm thankful? Because God's grace is the only thing that's going to save that warped city. You, the only way you people in Corinth have got a prayer is by the grace of God. But he had to reflect back on himself after that and think to himself, I, I'm the same way. The only prayer I got is by the grace of God too. For in him, that's Christ Jesus, for in him you have been enriched in every way. Now watch this. The enrichment process is specifically with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. Now here in just a second in context, he's going to talk about the miraculous gifts. Okay. But, and I think that that's what he's, this is an introduction to that as well. But it's interesting that he is going to say to one of the 
arguably most immature congregations addressed in all of the New Testament. He's going to say to them, you have got all kinds of speech and all kinds of knowledge. You have been blessed with this. I'm of the personal opinion, as I studied the Church of Corinth, I'm of the personal opinion that they were over, they were just bubbling over with potential. But like so often, you've seen this, like so often is the case in the world even today, people who have tons and tons and tons of, attention, uh, of potential, they can't seem to ever tap into it. They can't ever seem to settle down and just wah, let her go. Corinth seems to be that way. I think when Paul, he's going to write about all the potential that they have with regards to miraculous gifts, et cetera, et cetera. I, Corinth is a major, you know, major city as far as crossroads of, of commerce is concerned. There was just so much there. But I think Paul was writing back constantly because they were so overwhelmed by the need to, uh, to get stuff in the world, to be a part of the world, instead of really being sanctified and set apart. So, all kinds of speech and knowledge. Then watch this. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you, therefore you do not lack any, watch it, spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for, the, for our Lord uh, Jesus Christ to be revealed. So God has confirmed all that he said previous. He's confirmed it, but most specifically their testimony, that is about the church of Corinth, about Christ among you and he being the one who confirms that what we said to you, Corinthians, is accurate, then here's the result. Because of that, therefore, you don't lack any spiritual gift. Now, again, I don't know what, if, he's, if this is to be taken literally or not, but I don't see why you couldn't, because if you study spiritual gifts, you are inevitably going to end up, a lot of the study, you're going to end up in the book of 1st 2nd Corinthians. Because that's where we really get the the not just descriptions of what was potential, but how they actually dealt with the spiritual gifts that they had. And so he, you don't lack any spiritual gift. And again, keep that in context. This is a crazy congregation. The potential is overwhelming. They don't lack anything. And yet Paul is going to go on now, and he is going to spend chapter after chapter after chapter trying to line them out. And some of the stuff he's going to say is actually common sense. In fact, he'll use terminology like that. But specifically here, here, specifically in this verse, he's talking about lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. And there's an eager awaiting for Jesus himself to be revealed. What is he specifically talking about here in the word reveal, you think? Waiting for him to be revealed. I mean, I guess there's a couple ways you can take it. Kind of. Usually revealed means it uh, comes out in the open. Okay. More of a. So I guess there's people there. They're it's basically saying that like they have the spiritual gifts. So basically, just to come out to the public and be like open. Maybe that's good. I, that's good. Them. Sure. I, there, there were a few churches that had a bigger evangelistic opportunity than Corinth. That's a good point. <laughs> Can you think of any other way it might he might be what other thing he might be referring to as far as revealed here? Um, I don't know. I think probably just Jesus coming back. Okay, second coming. Anybody else, Kathy? Possibly scripture. Hmm, that's a good one too. I thought of that. Sure. Sure, that's good. The enlightenment of that. I'm going to use that one and kind of what Blaine was saying to tie in. I really think it's probably more what Gabriel was saying, but the two of you have said something that I think is not only possible, I think it's probably factual. Notice what we just got done talking about. You've got all kinds of speech and all kinds of knowledge. You've got every spiritual gift. And then if I can finish the sentence as I think it might have been, so why in the world do you not know Jesus like you need to? It seemed like he would have been illuminated in your life by now. He would have really been revealed that you would have, you'd have seen that. And then to go with Blaine's point of view, and it seems to me like that the, the evangelistic opportunities would just be, whew, because you know Jesus. Okay. Now again, I think it's probably what, what uh, what's your name? Gabriel is saying specifically, but I, I really think what Kathy and Blaine were also uh, alluding to could be, could be factual as well, given the context that we have here. 
Anybody out there have something to say? There, my mom says that she's watching while they're going down the highway. <laughs> she says, "Good, they, they just left for Marmaduke because their dad has to preach down there, up there, <laughs> up there, because it's up there." All right, anybody? Are you watching? You, you have your dog, honey. So if you if you see a comment I need to respond to, will you let me know. All right, here continuing then in that vein, he says, "He will also keep you firm to the end." That's probably tying into this. Okay, reveal. So he's going to keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord. That's probably tying into this. So to be blameless on the day, uh, blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus. And it's interesting, you got all three of them in this one. Lord Jesus Christ. So when you when they referred to to refer to Jesus, they would sometimes just kind of, whoo, they'd really give you everything. He's the master, he's the savior, and he is the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's got the whole package. Um, so he is um, he is king. He is rescuer. Um, he anointed one could also tie in with the whole I, the, the whole idea of kingship, etc. Uh, so he just got the whole package. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And again, you see all those terms, Jesus Christ and Lord, there up here as well. Okay, notice that he's called you into fellowship. Now I'm going to back you up here. Called you into fellowship, watch the context. He's called you into fellowship because they are the church of God in court to so those sanctified in Christ Jesus. That's how you get into fellowship. Called to be holy people. That's the way you stay in fellowship. Together with everybody in the world, calling on the name of Jesus Christ. That's part of the fellowship idea. Okay? And so he's saying to them then, God is faithful, and he's called you into this relationship, this moment of, of union. It's more than a moment. I was referring to the, you know, the whole idea of an experience of unity with, with, Jesus, uh, with the Son of God, who is Jesus Christ our Lord. Comments on that? Because this is kind of the end of the introductory stuff. Anybody? Got nine minutes left. All right, then let's go to the introductory stuff and watch this play out. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you. This is a pretty radical opening to the book of 1 Corinthians, given what we know about Corinth and all the crazy problems that they had. But it's also kind of a radical statement for even us today. I want you to have such unity in the church that there are no divisions among you. But that presents a problem. Because no two people are exactly alike. God did not design us to come into the church and be clones. He designed us to be different. And so how do you make this passage play out with the play? into the reality of all the differences we have within the church. Let me share a passage with you. Wasn't that cute? Did you guys see the thing? The arrow just... That was really good one. Okay, Romans 14. Nobody seemed to like it. Accept those whose faith is weak without quarreling and, uh, over disputable matters. That kind of ties into this whole idea of no divisions, doesn't it? Kind of what he was talking about there. This idea you guys can be one. But notice that he's going to talk in the next two verses about two very unique, different scenarios. And then watch how he concludes it. God has accepted them. And he's talking about both of these. One person's faith will allow them to eat anything. Another guy's faith is weak and he can only eat vegetables. The one who eats everything must not. Treat with contempt, that is, look down upon, make him feel bad, think that he's a, a lower life form, all of that kind of thing. The one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything, must not judge the one who does. Why? For God has accepted them. This is the phrase I use when addressing Romans 14 and other places in Scripture with regards to division, etc., in order to understand the harmony of the Bible. He is not saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that we have to become clones of each other. In fact, he's going to talk about having being united in mind. It's not like you have to have a mind bond, kind of like 
Star Trek, you might remember Spock, and he'd put his fingers up against somebody. That's probably, you guys don't remember Spock, but he used to do this, and he could have a, I don't, what do they call it, a mind blend or something, but he, he could do this, he could read your mind, and then he could feel your feelings and all of that. It, it's not like God is saying that you've got to have a, a cloned brain of everybody else in the church. That's not what he is saying, according to the harmony of Scripture. Because clearly in verses 2 and 3, he says we've got two guys here, and they're, they're totally different. One guy thinks you can eat whatever you want. Another guy says, no, you can only eat vegetables. They're just like rat. And if you were to go on in the context, he's going to talk later, he's going to talk about celebrating spe special holidays. One guy thinks you can just celebrate them all. Another guy says, no. You know. And so clearly they've got their mind is not united. It can't be. Because one guy's mind says you can eat anything. Another guy's mind says, no, you can only eat vegetables. And so we got to ask ourselves, what does he mean in 1 Corinthians 1 when he talks about no divisions and being united in mind? It can't be this whole idea that we all just kind of, you know, throw to the wind all of our convictions just so that our brother can have his way or our sister can do it the way she wants to get it done. It doesn't mean that at all. Coming back then, notice what he says here specifically is, don't do this with disputable matters. Things that God hasn't addressed. Specifically, things that haven't been commanded in Scripture. It's a disputable matter, and therefore you and I ought not have to, or we ought not, create a stink over something that God's not given us specific directives over. And another reason is because God, God says it. God can accept both of these mindsets, both of these convictions of the heart. Why? Because one, they, they identify this guy as the mature and this guy as the weak. Notice he's the faith is weak. But why? Because there are two different levels of maturity. So how in the world do you bring about unity within the church when you've got two different levels of maturity? Well, number one, you've got to make sure that those levels of maturity are specifically addressing things that are disputable matters. They're not things that are clearly set out in Scripture. If it's clearly set out in Scripture, you and I don't have any debate over it. It doesn't matter if you're a whiny pants or not. You need a man up. But if you are dealing with something that's a disputable matter, then you, you, you've got time to just kind of, okay, let's mature together. And if I'm, the, if I'm the, the stronger brother, I need to take time to let you grow up. If you're the stronger brother, then the other way. But if, let's say you're, you're the weaker brother. If you're the weaker brother, then you ought not run down the trail condemning me because I feel like that there's a liberty in this particular area. You need to have the maturity enough to say, I might just not have discovered it yet. I can see by the rest of your life that you're clearly loyal to Christ. You're trying your best to study and to know Jesus. And so I'm going to assume, give you the benefit of the doubt, that you're an individual who is really trying to do what's right. God has accepted it. Now, that's, that's an interesting harmony of Scripture to help us understand what he has to be. He can't be when he says no divisions, he cannot be saying that everybody thinks exactly the same thing in the church. He just simply can't because here's an illustration where they didn't. They're not clones of each other, but they do have unity specifically in this passage in disputable matters. Now I want to take you back so that you can be true to context. This is something that I think is very, very important for us here at SBS. Be true to context. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. That seems almost utopian in nature, that you're going to get united in mind and thought. But stay with the context. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. Oh, now we're going to get an illustration of what he actually means in context, and this is what it is. What I mean to say is specifically this. What I'm saying with regards to this idea of no divisions and have a united mind is specifically one of you says, I follow Paul. Another of you says, I follow Apollos. Somebody else says, no, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. That's specifically in context what he's talking about here. So when he says no divisions and our minds need to be totally unified, it's specifically in this thrust that we're not going to go run off after some man's thoughts and opinions. The church wasn't built on Paul, Peter, John. Who else we got here? Somebody else was here. Paulus. Okay. I guess John's not even mentioned there, but anyhow. It's the church was built upon Christ. 
Now, in this scenario, going back to Romans 14, this guy would be the mature guy, right? He's the one who knows, because he, he's the one who says, no, 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 we need to follow Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's the most mature position. So here's the, the strong brother, right? Here's the weak brother. The weak brother says, no, I follow Paul. No, I follow Cephas. What should the strong brother do with regards to the fellow who's preaching, you need to follow Apollos, you need to follow Paul? He better call him out. See, this is totally different than Romans 14. You know why? This isn't a disputable matter. The church is founded on Jesus, not Paul and Apollos and Cephas and anybody else. And so in this context, he's saying, listen, I call you out because I understand, and up here we're in Chloe's household, some folks have told me that you guys got some nutso stuff going down there as far as division is concerning in Corinth, and I'm calling you out. Don't you be divided. Make sure that you have a united mind, specifically in this problem. Because in this particular problem, there shouldn't be any debate. Because this is not a disputable matter. Comments on that? I think this is a very, very powerful passage. Are you going to comment, Blake? You're scratching your chin like you have something very brainy to say there. All right, we're going to end here. So he's appealing to them, brothers and sisters, so the whole church, and he's doing it in the name of Jesus, which you can't get any higher calling that you agree. Agree, no divisions, united in mind and thought, etc. but specifically in what he's going to address, and that is don't be running after men. Run after Jesus. All right. Well, we, Laura's out there. Hi, Laura. Thank you. Appreciate you for joining us. Appreciate all of you so much. Love and appreciate you. Next Wednesday, God willing, we will continue into chapter 1, but we'll be down at verse 13. Uh, and the goal is during the semester, we're going to, as we've done, pop, 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 you know, throughout. For you uh, SBS students that are here and you want to do your homework, remember, it has to be something that uh, we covered in the, uh, the text this evening. Anything we need to say before I shut her down? Thank you guys for joining us. God bless you. Be there. Matthew 16, 26.